Greetings. I'm excited so many of you are reading this book, uh, Walter Brueggemann's From Judgment to Hope, A Study of the Prophets. And no, uh, Walter Brueggemann is one of the, the great scholars uh, in this uh, particular subject, uh, uh, one of the, the great uh, biblical scholars. Um, and I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about um, why I think this is important, what I think uh, I've gleaned thus far from reading it, what I hope you gleam, um, and why uh, it, the prophet's uh, impact us uh, so many years after the stories that they tell. Uh, in one part is they come up again and again in our liturgical life, in our storytelling as we uh, walk the, uh, the faith um, and, and as we go through the, the Christian year. Uh, listen to some of these passages, and this is just from, um, uh, from Isaiah. Uh, know that we don't go through many Ash Wednesdays without hearing from Joel, uh, rend your hearts, not your garments, or through an Easter vigil uh, without hearing about those bones uh, coming to life from Ezekiel, uh, that so many of the passages uh, we find again and again. Or uh, if we've uh, laid to rest a loved one, uh, we're likely to have, uh, to have heard this, uh, he will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. Um, and then this time of year, as we've gone through uh, Advent and Christmas, uh, maybe uh, some of these uh, ring familiar. Uh, this going back to, um, to the, where, how we started Advent with our lessons and carols. A shoot shall come out from the stock of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Or, uh, or this one. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Uh, that was read on Christmas Day. And, uh, and there's several others uh, that we've read during Advent as we anticipate um, uh, that prediction uh, coming true. Uh, and it definitely frames the way that we look at uh, the prophets. I think uh, because so much of the time that we read the scriptures is in anticipation of Jesus being born, uh, we, uh, we make a kind of a, a, a beeline uh, from uh, what the prophets um, uh, were experiencing and saying uh, to the fruition in the birth of Jesus. And I, and I think we do a little injustice to it when we do that. Uh, certainly for us, um, that is the lens that we look at it through, um, but that's not the only lens. And so, uh, so I invite us to take a step back and to uh, kind of understand uh, what the prophets were saying in their time and in their place. And uh, one of the main things I think that uh, I've gleaned from the prophets um, is the commitment to the belief that God is in the world and God is an act of God. God is acting uh, uh, toward God's vision at all times. And um, um, at the time that, uh, that a lot of the prophets were, uh, uh, were writing, uh, there was a belief in, uh, in other traditions and totem gods where uh, the gods were off, often like a, a good luck charm. You'd pray to the gods uh, for things you wanted, a different god for this, a different god for that. Um, and, um, and gods almost serve the individual. Uh, and this is a reminder, uh, the prophets are um, a reminder that um, that God serves God's vision for the universe, that, that, uh, that God is loyal to God's people, but God is also loyal to God's vision for the way that the world could be and should be. And, um, and often um, uh, it is uh, not necessarily meant to be a predictor of things to come. Um, there is a vision that is cast out that's, um, uh, that is a beautiful vision, a vision of the way the world could be, of, uh, of what the world would look like uh, and especially what Jerusalem would look like um, uh, in God's hands uh, through God's vision. Uh, it's a hoped-for vision. It's a vision that, um, that as uh, Brueggemann says, uh, shows an emancipation of the prophets from the way the world actually is in their particular day and time, uh, that they can see beyond the, uh, the destruction, beyond the, the sinfulness and brokenness of their time, uh, to see a vision of what it would look like when, God, um, when God's vision was realized. Uh, and and that God would never uh, never abandon God's people, and so that the that vision is always uh, in the works in in some way. And so that's one of the beautiful things about the uh, the prophets uh, is that it's not only uh, a, a judgment, uh, but it's a judgment that uh, 
that ultimately uh, leads towards hope because the same God uh, that cares enough about the universe to have a vision uh, and to, to work towards that, that vision is a God that, 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 that will ultimately lead us uh, towards something more hope-filled. Um, the prophets were often uh, railing against um, uh, social ills of the time, the way that people fell short of the law um, and, uh, and believed wholeheartedly uh, that God wouldn't let things stay that way. When, uh, when people uh, were inhabiting uh, that chosen land, that place that was promised to them, uh, and they were doing so uh, without fidelity to their side of, uh, 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 of the covenant, uh, to follow the law, to take care of the widow, um, uh, to, to seek justice, to do justice, um, uh, to love God and put God at the center of their lives, uh, that when they weren't living consistently uh, to that, um, that there would be consequences, that this couldn't continue forever, that, uh, that God cared enough about God's uh, vision for the world, that God cared enough about us uh, not to let um, us continue along that path. Uh, just like amidst destruction, God cared enough about us and cared enough about God's vision to not leave us in despair either. Um, and so uh, my first point, uh, and I think uh, Brueggemann's first point, is that it is neither, um, uh, the prophets are neither uh, fortune tellers uh, predicting the future uh, with, with specificity, uh, nor are they just social advocates uh, uh, expressing um, a, a desire for people to do better. Um, it is, um, it's more than that. So I encourage you uh, to open your eyes uh, widely and, and to uh, sort of jump in and to, uh, to see where the, the, the prophets take you. Uh, one of the uh, ways that we look at, um, at the, the prophets is historically, what was going on at the time. And there's a, uh, there's a great timeline uh, in the back that, uh, that reminds us that there was um, uh, two, two generations after David, a division between the kingdom. The kingdom was divided between the, uh, the north kingdom, uh, which was Israel, and the south uh, kingdom, uh, Judah. Uh, and, um, uh, and several of the prophets uh, came from either the north or the south, uh, but uh, the first set of prophets, the older prophets, spoke in advance of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the occupation uh, of uh, Jerusalem. And they spoke uh, and with anticipation uh, that the life that they were living couldn't continue, uh, that the life they were living um, wasn't in accord with God's law and that there would be consequences. And uh, it's worth noting that, that Isaiah, uh, is, it's, it's one of the major prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, uh, it's written, it's so large, uh, it is written uh, generally by three, regarded by three, maybe even five uh, authors, but over a, a huge expanse of time. Uh, it's not written all at one time. Uh, even uh, the first uh, author isn't believed to have written it all at one time, but it's, uh, it encompasses centuries of, of history. Uh, and the first part uh, was before uh, the fall of, of Jerusalem, before the Babylonian exile. Uh, and so Isaiah and, um, and Amos and Hosea and, and, and Micah, um, a lot of that writing in that period is, um, is really uh, looking closely at, at how people are missing the mark. Uh, and how, how can we do better? What's God's vision for the world? And if we don't uh, move our lives closer to God's vision, that there will be consequences. Um, and then there was the, then there was, uh, the Babylonian captivity um, and, um, and a lot of um, the visions during that time um, were filled with hope, with the, with the, uh, uh, the commitment that, um, that yes, uh, people had missed the mark. Yes, there had been consequences. Yes, God had acted. Uh, remember that, that pervasive belief that, that all of these actions are, uh, are divine, that God has acted because uh, people have fallen short, um, but that God isn't done. And that uh, some of the really hope-filled visions that come out of that um, are, uh, are, are, uh, are because uh, the prophets were convincing folks this is not the end. God is not done with God's people. And so hold on, uh, maintain your faith, trust in God. There is hope. Um, 
And then uh, after the destruction of the temple and after uh, uh, the Babylonians uh, had occupied for some time, and now we're a couple centuries later, um, the fall was in 720 BC, and now we're in about uh, uh, 540 BC. So um, a couple centuries later, uh, the Assyrians, um, which is the other uh, uh, the other side of both are kind of in Iraq, but uh, the Assyrians uh, uh, conquered the Babylonians uh, and um, they let people back in. A lot of the people that were exiled from Jerusalem back in uh, and um, and there was a lot more hope at the time. And second Isaiah uh, was written at this time and sort of captures a lot of that um, a, a, a lot of that positivity of uh, of God doing something new that uh, um, that, that that Jerusalem uh, wouldn't end uh, the way that it, it had that that um, and, and as they returned it, it wasn't always a pretty sight uh, it uh, it had been destroyed and uh, the temple had been destroyed the um, the city had been sacked uh, there were wasn't a whole lot of uh, uh, of industry right away there and uh, there was a lot of work to be done and, and a lot of that prophetic imagery of what a new Jerusalem might look like uh, spoke to the folks that heard it as um, as hope that uh, Jerusalem would be restored, that uh, that there would be a time where um, where that promised land was everything they both remembered it generationally to be uh, and everything that they hoped that it could become. And so, um, so second Isaiah speaks a lot to that. Um, and, um, uh, and during third Isaiah, um, uh, we really... Uh, get a sense of restoration that um, that Isaiah is uh, uh, building up a vision of uh, of a new Jerusalem that would draw people uh, to it that it would be the center uh, and uh, and it's worth noting that um, that there is incredible amounts of poetry um, there's imagery uh, the whole uh, prophetic witness of Jonah is entirely told uh, through story uh, but that um, that a lot of the things that we point directly to Jesus, um, uh, certainly uh, in a lot of Jewish tradition, uh, pointed towards uh, an anointed one, a Messiah coming uh, to lead uh, people. Um, but a lot of it was also seen as um, uh, as an image of Jerusalem, uh, as a personification of Jerusalem, and that uh, the restoration, um, the vision, uh, was 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 less about an individual person, uh, but about the hopes of all Jerusalem being lifted up. Um, and so, uh, so there's a good reason why not everybody who uh, uh, who not just read but lived uh, by the prophets, who hoped by the prophets, uh, uh, saw Jesus as the fulfillment of, of, of it the way that we do. Uh, when we look back, um, but the, um, the, pro the, the prophet spoke differently to, to people at a different time and place. Uh, and so that's the historical reading. Uh, there's also a, a, a canonical reading. How does this fit uh, into the, the story? Um, uh, how is it part of uh, the whole uh, a compass of scripture? And then finally, what do we do with it? If this speaks uh, specifically about a particular place in a particular time uh, to a particular people that are not us uh, necessarily, uh, how does it have meaning in our lives? Um, and I think Brueggemann goes into great detail. He compares 9-11 uh, uh, to um, the fall of Jerusalem and, um, and how that shocked our sensibilities, how that shocked our uh, sense of, uh, of being uh, uh, impenetrable, that uh, both our economic uh, uh, towers uh, and our uh, you know, somewhat isolated status and our uh, at least uh, somewhat uh, uh, deeply held belief uh, or held in some way belief that, uh, that, that that we were held in God's favor in some way and that uh, so much of that uh, was shooken uh, on 9-11 and, um, and how we rebuild and, and how we find hope. Um, and so uh, so it is, uh, there is a lot of room for us to read um, the, 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 the prophets and see a, a, a resonance and a, a message for our time. Uh, but it's important that we read it through all the different lenses that uh, that Brueggemann provides, so that uh, so that we understand uh, uh, what it meant to the prophets and the listeners uh, in that time, so that we understand what it means to us uh, as Christians, uh, what it under uh, what it meant to our our, our, our brothers and sisters of um, of Israel, uh, and then uh, how it fits into the larger story uh, that uh, that that we've. Uh, that we've been gifted in, in, in Scripture, and then how does it affect our lives? So, uh, I hope this brief summary gives you a little bit of, uh, of insight into, um, uh, into the, 
the prophets. And I hope that uh, reading this gives you a lot, lot more. So I enjoy uh, uh, hearing uh, your thoughts on it. And certainly uh, feel free to, uh, to ask me any questions. I'll probably have to get back to you on a lot of them. Uh, but I'm uh, glad that we're walking this uh, journey together. God bless you.